After World War I, tanks became a fixture of European battlefields, but the US, mostly because of the local geographic conditions, was not as impressed with the whole idea. That's why, at the start of World War II, the American army found itself in a pretty precarious place, as their tanks were simply not adequate for the tasks at hand. American engineers didn't take long to develop the legendary Sherman, but long before that, there was a separate plan in the US to develop a specialized anti-tank vehicle, a lightly armored but well-armed tank destroyer. Initially, the US military hoped to receive this new vehicle in as early as the 1930s, but as there was no suitable platform for it, development stalled. Engineers were looking for a platform that would be highly mobile, highly reliable, and could carry a powerful armament. All of that at the same time. To make matters worse, there was no consensus on any of those requirements, including the need for a powerful gun. In 1941, there was no longer any time to pick and choose, and so the U.S. was forced to start the mass production of a new SPG based on the M3 half-track. However, the military quickly realized that the new tank destroyer wasn't really effective against modern tanks, as its 75mm gun, developed in 1897, wasn't exactly a high-end armament that they were hoping for. To be fair, the vehicle still performed pretty well against armored targets in northern Africa, but the unfortunate specifics of both the platform and the gun were putting too many American lives at risk. Fortunately, it didn't take long for American engineers to come up with a solution. They finally had a proper platform, the new M4A2 medium tank, and a proper gun, the 76mm T12 cannon. Insights accrued during the development of the M4 helped the team come up with the sloped armor arrangement for the hull. The last piece of the puzzle was that the Army requested an SPG with a fully rotating turret, and not a vehicle with a fixed or casemate superstructure. Despite all that, engineers managed not only to solve this puzzle but to actively improve the design. They succeeded in making the hull light enough for the vehicle to be pretty mobile, as required by the original specifications. The end result of all that hard work was the M10 tank destroyer, featuring a newly developed hull and modern armament. In 1942, it was pretty much everything that the US Army had hoped for. The US quickly started producing the M10 in large numbers, with thousands upon thousands of SPGs shipped to their own units, to the USSR, as well as to the forces of the French resistance. The M10 could easily destroy the Panzer IV and comparable vehicles even at long ranges, which made the engagements a lot safer for American troops. That's not to say that the brand new tank destroyer was completely without flaws. For instance, it had a terrible turret rotation speed, as the crew had to use a hand crank to rotate the turret. Furthermore, its 76mm gun was already not powerful enough to fight the most advanced German vehicles, most notably the Panther. It wasn't just the US that was searching for a solution to this new problem. Across the pond, the British armed forces were using more than 1,500 M10s. Naturally, they wanted to give the vehicle more firepower, and they achieved that by outfitting it with a British 17-pounder. And it worked. The new gun was capable of piercing the defenses of Panthers. But all the other flaws of the original M10 were still there. But American engineers weren't twiddling their thumbs either. And as early as 1943, they started testing a successor to the M10 that was based on the same platform. This time, the military decided to equip the tank destroyer with a 90mm cannon that was originally a heavy anti-aircraft gun playing a role similar to the German Pac-43. The problem was that the new armament didn't solve any existing issues with the turret, like the unhandiness of the design for the gunner. What's worse, the new gun also introduced a slew of new problems. As a result, a decision was made to design a brand new turret, with powered traverse and more space for the crew. But by that point, the US actually decided to stop producing the M10, as it was gradually becoming obsolete. Naturally, the team behind the project started to look for an alternative, a different chassis that they could mount their brand new turret on. 
But in the end, the M36 that was accepted into service in 1944 still turned out to be a bit of a hybrid. A new turret on the old M10 platform. The original M36, as well as its M36B2 variant, were both based on the M10. But it's worth noting that there were also a few tank destroyers of the new series that used the Sherman M4A3 chassis. Those were designated M36B1. Both types of the M36 fought well, and not just against Panthers and Tigers, but also against many other vehicles long after the end of World War II. The M36 was also used in Korea, in other parts of Asia, and even in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. But any video on World War II era American SPGs would be incomplete without mention of the M18, the last member of the holy triad of iconic American tank destroyers of the time. The M18 was developed independently of the M10 and the M36, as the Army wanted to add yet another fast tank destroyer to the roster. The M18 was an extremely lightweight, highly mobile vehicle on a new fast chassis, armed with a 76mm gun. It was a perfect fit for American tank destroyer battalions with their tactic of rapid deployment, followed by an equally quick disengagement after firing. In real life, all three of those tank destroyers were often used as a readily available alternative to conventional tanks. Obviously, it was the Sherman that was the backbone of the American offensive, but thanks to their well-designed chassis and fully rotating turrets, those tank destroyers were often employed in the same capacity. The Wolverine, the Slugger, and the Hellcat, a spectacular achievement of the American defense industry. Which one is your favorite, by the way? Tell us in the comments below. <laughs>